So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. Uh, my name is Karthik Ramana, and I'm a professor here and the uh, director of the Masters in Public Policy, which is our flagship program here at the Blavatnik School. I can see that there are uh, several people here who are maybe new to the Blavatnik School, so let me say a couple words about the school and about our fantastic cohort of students here, some of whom are also in the room. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker as well as our moderator for today. So the Blavatnik School is uh, created as a school of government for the University of Oxford, and uh, uh, Oxford University has had a long tradition of uh, bringing people who are interested in careers in public service and public leadership uh, here through a number of years, and the school represents in some sense a culmination of uh, uh, that long history and uh, providing a common space, a common roof for uh, individuals with interest in this area to come together, uh, particularly under the Master's in Public Policy program. Uh, the school is, uh, has the aspiration or the ambition of being the place where the world's best thinking on public leadership happens uh, through our faculty scholarship. We have about 25 uh, full-time faculty uh, on staff now. and. Uh, uh, we have an MPP program that has about 124 students uh, this year uh, from 70 different countries, 70 different countries. So it's a remarkably diverse uh, group of students uh, representing uh, individual and a very diverse range of experiences as well. We have students who are maybe two or three years out of college but have accomplished a great deal in that time. And, and we have some students who have substantial experience uh, in the sense of helping run ministries or uh, run, running offices of the president in various countries, jurisdictions across the world. So it's a, a great group of students and a great uh, sort of community that we're building here. Um, so our, uh, con our talk today is the promise of Trump. Uh, one of the things we did here on the eve of the U.S. election was uh, uh, keep uh, the school open over the night so that we could uh, uh, be all here to watch the results as they came in in that forum that you walked by uh, to come in. We uh, had uh, large TV screens set up, and students came and camped out as they watched the results come in. Uh, and around 4 a.m. Uh, U.K. time, the results became uh, pretty apparent. Uh, and the one thing I said to students at that point, um, uh, as we were all sort of uh, getting ready to go home, was uh, there isn't a more exciting time to be building a school of government. Um, <laughs> because uh, all of the old rules have been basically shown the boot, both here in Britain uh, and now uh, in America. And uh, for us, as a new school of government, trying to reimagine what it means to serve the public, uh, here is an opportunity to put everything back on the table. And it's in that spirit that uh, we are delighted to welcome uh, Professor S.P. Kotari uh, to be our speaker today. Um, Professor Kotari is a professor of economics, finance, and accounting at uh, uh, MIT Sloan School of Management, uh, he, uh, which is uh, where I got my PhD. Uh, and Professor Kotari is one of those rare academics who has accomplished a great deal in his uh, professional life as an academic. He's, uh, his, his particular uh, specialty is the informational efficiency of financial reporting information vis-a-vis uh, -vis stock prices. And he is uh, uh, probably the most cited individual in that field in the world. Um, and, but he's also one of those academics who has been able to uh, bridge the gap between academia and the real world. And particularly in a time period from 2008 to 2010, when everybody was fleeing finance, uh, Professor Kotari decided to take the plunge in and became the head of research for BGI. Uh, which is one of the largest asset uh, managers in the world, and he uh, oversaw a portfolio of $100 billion in what uh, most finance industry insiders will tell you is probably one of the toughest periods to do so, uh, at least since uh, 1929. Uh, and so he's someone who has accomplished a great deal both in industry and uh, in, uh, in academia. Uh, and so we're delighted to have him here to provide a very balanced perspective on what he might see as uh, the, the strengths and the opportunities uh, that a Trump presidency uh, will provide. Um, the format of today's uh, conversation is uh, uh, Professor Kotari will speak uninter uninterrupted for about 30 minutes, uh, and then we will be open for Q&A. 
And in the spirit of the Blavatnik School, the moderator for our Q&A will be uh, one of our own MPP students, uh, Jonathan Padilla, uh, who goes by JP. Uh, and JP is a graduate of Harvard College uh, and has uh, uh, spent uh, a great deal of time thinking about questions and challenges in government. Uh, he's particularly concerned about government innovation. Uh, and he's a member of the student government here at the Blavatnik School uh, and serves uh, in the role of external relations representative in student government. And JP is one of the inaugural winners of the Schwarzman Fellowship uh, and will be headed to China next year to spend a year in the newly created Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University. So we're delighted that JP will have the role of taking questions and answers from you uh, in the last uh, 45 minutes of this, uh, of this talk. Uh, so the only thing that I will uh, say now is that this talk is live streamed on uh, YouTube. Uh, so uh, there is a camera in the back that will be capturing uh, uh, in particular the speaker. And uh, so your questions will also make it on to uh, the, uh, the live broadcast. And we understand there are a lot of people watching this live uh, right now. Uh, and so if you are asking a question, uh, some of my colleagues will be in the back of the room with these uh, handheld mics. And so do wait for JP to call on you before you ask on your question, uh, and then wait for the mic to come to you before you ask your question so that it could be picked up for the people who are going to watch this on YouTube. Okay, and with that, uh, delighted to welcome uh, Professor S.P. Kotari. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Karthik, for that introduction. Delighted to be here. Uh, it's, uh, there's a sense in which I feel like a gladiator, you know, and uh, based on what I have heard about the uh, political leanings of uh, individuals. But that said, you know, uh, my, my goal is to provide, as, as the title says, a balanced perspective. I, I hope I remain faithful to that, and I, I will be candid in terms of what I see are the strengths and weaknesses and what are the promise areas. So that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, I also, from time to time, uh, you know, will make some comparisons with some other individuals. And the purpose is not to try to portray those individuals in any bad light or good light. And therefore, by comparison, make Mr. Trump look good or bad. But the purpose of those comparisons is to demonstrate that you know, if we think only in terms of absolute terms, it's very easy to characterize someone as good or bad. But when we do some comparisons, then we are forced to be internally consistent. And that helps us make some judgments that are, I think, more balanced. So it is only with that intention that I will draw some comparisons, especially if in the Q&A. But please, uh, my desire is not to make anyone else look good or bad, especially not look anyone bad. Because I do feel that whether they may be conservatives or liberals, by and large, they are all well-intentioned. It's just that their ideology their thinking as to what would be good for the society and good for the country, those approaches, they diverge in that respect. But in terms of their intentions, they are pure and they are well-meaning. And I would say that about pretty much all the candidates on both sides of the aisle. So with that, let me dive into <coughs> the uh, structure of my talk. And I want to start with <laughs> tantrums. And, and first, I, I do want to get that out of the way in the sense that more often than not, in the past, say, six months or a year, in conversation that I've had, it's very often difficult to get past the personality issues. And I think that misses the point, because all individuals, they have certain personalities, good or bad, desirable or not desirable. But we have to get past that, in my opinion, if we want to get to the heart of the substance 
of the issue. So it is with that, I, I want to acknowledge that there are some concerns, and I will talk about those, what I have labeled them as tantrums. Then I want to get to the meat of the economic issues, and I label that as Trumponomics. And third, Trump in the globe in the sense that while Trumponomics and Trump in the globe, the international setting, they're really not totally divergent. But just so that I might organize my talk, I have focused on Trumponomics issues and then whatever is beyond that is part of the Trump in the globe, in the international setting, but the two are highly interrelated because the domestic economic issues that Trump will address, those will have repercussions internationally, and that's the sense in which it's very much a global discussion, but as I said, nonetheless, just to, uh, for the purposes of organization, I have structured the discussion in this fashion. <clears throat> in terms of the tantrums, okay, what I want, what I hope to avoid is to a desire and rushing to judgment, saying that it's game over, meaning thereby the person doesn't have the temperament to be the president, and therefore why bother with anything else? Well, certainly some have that viewpoint, and of course I cannot do anything about it, and, but my own thinking is that <clears throat> there is more to it than the issue about the temperament. Temperament certainly is an important consideration, but there is more to a presidency than the temperament. So what is it that people worry about? Uh, people worry about the fact that he might flip-flop on topics or he has a tendency to use tweets, and, <clears throat> and the tweets reflect um, an element of trying to uh, react to issues without spending a whole lot of time thinking about those issues. So that's the sense in which there is an instant, uh, instead of instant replay, it is instant reaction here. Uh, so those are some of the concerns. I'm sure there would be some other concerns, and those, in my opinion, do inject a degree of uncertainty as to how he might tackle certain issues, and there is an element of uncertainty. On the flip side, here is a man who is about 70 years old. He has been in business. He has dealt with a large number of individuals in, in so many of those settings, and he has had that temperament for decades. It's not something new, and still, he has managed to survive rather quite nicely. So somehow there is some mechanism that he has in place that copes with that temperament and still lets him come out ahead. So that gives me some comfort. But that said, in my opinion, there is an element of uncertainty as a result of, of the issues surrounding temperament. Then there are multiple claims, claims of misogyny, racism, vendetta, and divisive Supreme Court appointees, right, or potential for making divisive Supreme Court appointees. And in that, I personally, I think, uh, misogyny, racism, those, I, I don't think those are valid. They, they never were an issue until he became a candidate. Now, you might say that, why would people bring that up? But if you are doing business or if you are, you would have seen that in decades and decades, people would have talked about this person is against women or this person is against uh, certain races. That has never been an issue. It became an issue not just in his candidacy, but in, even in Romney's case, it was war on women kind of thing. So I think it is more a political attack than really an issue about he substantively being misogynist or racist. So that's at least my uh, view of it. In terms of divisive Supreme Court appointees, yes, I think that, that, that is, to me, substantively, that is the biggest issue. And, and there, I think, any presidential candidate, they appoint Supreme Court judges that are 
in line with their political ideology. That is the right that a president has earned as a result of the election. And I think, so where I, we would question is if that appointee is not qualified in the sense that is just pick someone who is not either experienced or not an intelligent individual or not professionally accomplished individual, then I think it would be a bigger concern. Or if it is so extreme politically that that also in my mind, even though I'm, I tend to be a conservative, I, I would not want someone to be appointed who is way out there on the right-hand side of the spectrum, just as if it was a left-wing uh, president, I would not want someone to be appointed who is way to the left of the spectrum. So, so that's the sense in which uh, I hope that the appointee would be, uh, in that sense, somewhat moderate as opposed to at the extreme. But that remains to be seen. Okay. Uh, finally, about uh, character, you know, that issue is also uh, important. And, and <clears throat> this is related to the temperament issues. Uh, leaders are, uh, whether they are in business or in politics, it's a very multifaceted kind of phenomenon, right? I mean, you know, we would like leaders to embody, uh, I have given, uh, I'm no expert in leadership, you know, perhaps someone like Karthik or some others might be uh, far more knowledgeable and more expertise in what constitutes good leadership. But in, in my simple-minded way, uh, leaders, uh, they, they embody, uh, for example, strategic vision, they have a good judgment, they come up with some ideas. They're generally smart individual. They have some ability to inspire, so on, so forth. They are decisive and, and along those lines. And at the same time, no leader is perfect. What you want is leader to appreciate what are his or her strengths and what are his or her weaknesses so that they put together a team that makes it a whole. When I work with entrepreneurs or with businesses, that's what, when the CEO, I talk to him or her, that's what I say, what is it that the business needs? And if that is a circle, what portion of that circle do you fill? Because that will tell you who you should add and what kind of strengths you should bring in to complement yourself so that you have that full circle. And are you willing to delegate to those individuals, the areas of responsibility where you do not have the greatest strength, but they bring to the table the strength that is necessary in order for the business to succeed. Now, the analogy from a business to politics may not be one-to-one, -one, but I think the principle is somewhat similar, and it is in that spirit that I see Mr. Trump as having many of these qualities, but not all, and I, it's, this is by no means an exhaustive list that I have put, put here, but at the same time, I do think that he has many of these qualities, and <clears throat> so in that sense, he, he uh, qualifies as, as a leader, but again, reasonable individuals might have somewhat different viewpoints, and, and perhaps some of that will come through in the Q&A. To the next point of Trumponomics, <clears throat> what's the main task ahead? What we know of last seven, eight years is that the growth has been uh, one to two percent on an annual basis, and uh, which is uh, lower than what has been historically, especially following some recessions. It has been more in the range of three to four percent, and and while one to two versus three to four, one might say that, gee, you know, what, does that make a difference? And actually, as economics goes, that makes quite a bit of difference. So, so the challenge is to accelerate economic growth <clears throat> equally inclusive growth. That is the other challenge that exists. Maybe it is because of technology, maybe it is because of outsourcing. <clears throat> For a variety of reasons, there's a segment of 
America, and that is probably true in other developed parts of the world or developing parts of the world as well, that segment of the population has felt that they, they have been left behind. And they haven't had, either because of education or because um, the way the economies have been organized, that the fruits of economic growth haven't been shared among uh, large fractions of the society. And that's the sense in which inclusive growth, and in fact, uh, the, the point that Trump repeatedly make, uh, made about bringing jobs back, that was really, in a way, talking about inclusive growth. That there is a segment of the society that has lost those jobs and is feeling somewhat hopeless. And that sense of hopelessness has to be remedied, as well as jobs have to be brought back. And that is at the heart of that inclusive growth phenomenon that was at least promised, that was uh, the promise that, that he has made in the, uh, during the electioneering. Whether that comes true or not, of course, remains to be seen. Now, in terms of if we think about what is it that he has proposed, and it seems uh, it, it's the four elements that he has talked about are jobs and fair trade, legal immigration, uh, infrastructure, and health care reform. Let me talk a little bit about each of these and, and then <clears throat> get to the uh, Trump in the globe. Okay. Uh, jobs and fair trade. Okay. Uh, I think one of the major reforms that one would expect to see is in terms of corporate taxes. Uh, corporate taxes, currently the U.S. corporate tax is about 35%. And OECD, uh, the tax rate is about 25%. And then there are some nations like Bermuda and some places, or even Ireland, which is only about 12%, and, and places like Bermuda where it is 0%. Uh, so I think uh, he would like to, he has promised that it would be brought down to 15%. If, if, if you ask me, I, I think fiscally it would be a challenge for him to uh, lower the tax rate to as much as 15%. So more realistically, I think it would be in line with OECD, about 25%. That's what I expect. If he does that, and then on top of that, if he maintains worldwide tax on multinationals, okay, and but eliminate deferral. So this is, while I don't want to get overly technical, and, and but but the point is that that if you, the advantage of, Basing it in Ireland for some company in the U.S. is that the Irish tax is only 12 percent, whereas the U.S. tax is 35 percent. But suppose now you make the tax in the U.S. only 25 percent, so at least the U.S. versus, say, England or some other places where the tax is also 25 percent, there is no advantage to move abroad. And a place like Ireland, yeah, you might say that, well, it's 12%, so why would you not move to Ireland there? But if you eliminate the uh, deferral element of worldwide taxes, then, then a multinational U.S. corporation will have to pay 25% unless it moves lock, stock, and barrel outside of the U.S. So that's the sense in which there are ways in which I think it can be made more attractive for uh, to collect reasonable amount of taxes, and yet the jobs are not uh, go abroad. There would be an incentive to invest in the U.S. Um, then there, on top of that, there is taxes to favor domestic production and penalize imports. So that's the sense in which that's the other lever that gets used, which can be uh, helpful in trying to retain jobs within the U.S. And, and Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, of course, he has pr proposed what strikes me as an extreme proposal, which is that no export tax, and uh, at the same time, if you import any amount, then that is not deducted. So you, you end up, Walmart, for example, which imports maybe $100 billion, and that $100 billion, when it imports goods, 
It obviously is subtracted in calculating income, but under Paul Ryan's proposal, that entire $100 billion would not be permitted to be deducted as an expense, and as a result, it would be a huge penalty. So in my sense, in my opinion, I think Paul Ryan's proposal goes extreme, but directionally, it's in the right place. And I expect that as a result of if, if Trump's administration moves in that direction, that would be helpful in creating jobs within the U.S. Uh, perhaps uh, even more important is business-friendly regulation. Now, regulation, uh, whenever that word uh, comes up, people start thinking in terms of 2008 crisis and as if that crisis was uh, engendered by by lax regulation. Uh, I think different uh, individuals have different views about what caused contributed to that financial crisis. But that said, uh, businesses, small as well as large, have complained bitterly about excessive regulation and making it very difficult. And part of the reason why Brexit took place is also because EU, uh, that is part of the story at least, that the perception was that the regulation was getting to be stifling, and, and that's the sense in which uh, uh, business-friendly regulation, including labor laws, is something that is expected from the Trump administration, which would result in, in uh, more development, in more growth in <coughs> businesses, and, and more investment, and that would lead to more jobs. Okay. Uh, international trade. The concern, uh, if, if you think about international trade, of course, any standard textbook, and all of us would readily relate to the concept that free trade would be value maximizing. So there are benefit gains from trade, and this is a concept that has been established at least a couple hundred years ago, and, and we, nobody is going to dispute that as a concept. Now, when you get into the details, of course, that's where whether the, that pure concept sh should be embraced without asking any questions, that's, that's where I think the interesting part comes up. And the challenge is the short-term adjustment costs, and those can be devastating. Let me give you one example and, and very brief. You know, uh, my niece in India, she works, uh, she has a master's in bioinformatics, and she works and her pay is less than $2 an hour. Okay. And just a few months ago, the janitorial staff at MIT reached an agreement for wage of $23.67 per hour. Okay. So the gulf in the wages is so large, and the population with low wages outside of the developed world is so large that by the time that the benefits of free trade accrue to both sides and high tide lifts all boats, that argument to work, the intervening adjustment period can be decades long. And that's the sense in which I think the embracing free trade without any strings attached would be at least counterproductive to large fractions of the society. And that's the sense in which I think the concept of fair trade and not a blind <coughs> embracing of free trade is something that is being talked about. Now, whether in that endeavor, whether Mr. Trump goes too far or goes too little, remains to be seen. That's the degree of uncertainty there. Some of the rhetoric that you might have heard, that seems to suggest that he might go too far. But there are checks and balances. And when reality sets in, the pragmatism will incline him to be more moderate about it. That's true, I think, of almost all of his promises. So that was one was sloganeering and electioneering in which there was some hyperbole, whereas reality is that I think it would be much more uh, restrained behavior. Okay. Uh, legal immigration, this is a hot button issue. I'm an immigrant, so naturally, you know, and, and <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh, 
obviously, you know, nobody is against immigration per se, but where I think the population got somewhat tired was of illegal immigration. So should we have only legal immigration or illegal immigration? That's the uh, real issue here. And, and, and naturally, you know, should we have some control over our borders so that the people who do enter the U.S. who, who receive all the social services, okay, should that number be controlled in a fashion that is in line with legal immigration? That is one issue. There's also law and order. I personally am not a big fan of sanctuary cities. And, and the, re the reason is if there are federal laws, I think we, we should. There is a way in which laws that we think are not justified, that are not good, we protest against those laws. There is a system that has been put in place in terms of how we fight those laws. But one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the commitments that we make as part of any republic is that we will abide by the set of laws that have been demo democratically enacted. And that's the sense in which I personally have difficulty appreciating this whole concept of sanctuary cities, and I think it goes counter to the basic principle of law and order, and that's the sense in which I think there is going to be some tension between Trump and, and some of the large cities who have embraced, who have declared those cities as sanctuary cities. Another concern with uh, immigration has been that, especially uh, displacement of low-end jobs. And, and if you think about it, you know, the, the, many of the immigrants are willing to take jobs at 7 8 or $10 per hour, and welfare pays that much. So many of the legal uh, residents, inner-city residents, of course, you know, for them, welfare might be more attractive than, than doing a job at 7 8 or $10. And then, uh, so that's the sense in which distortion is being introduced, and I think uh, <clears throat> con controlling immigration at sort of reasonable levels would be helpful in increasing the labor participation rates within the U.S., and actually the wages will uh, tend to rise in segments of the society that is most adversely affected by uh, illegal immigration. Uh, infrastructure, I think uh, both sides of the aisle would readily agree that infrastructure is a good idea, and that was the uh, purpose behind what Obama was trying to do as well for the last eight years, and I think, I think uh, Trump would want, want to do it on steroids, you know, that activity. So that's the sense in which there would be greater investments and there would be some positive externality in, in addition to uh, immediate creation of jobs, but uh, infrastructure, whether it is hard or soft, is likely to enhance productivity and efficiency of operations, and that would help in terms of productivity as well as growth. Healthcare reform, I mean, this is perhaps the most difficult kind of uh, issues, and <clears throat> In my opinion, repealing Obamacare without a good replacement would be a disaster. I think it is extraordinarily important that we acknowledge that we have to provide a safety net to those who are uh, economically disadvantaged, economically challenged uh, section of the population. I think providing a safety net is important. So if, if I may think about the contours of a good replacement, that they would be uh, to allow more interstate competition. Uh, second is to allow premiums to be tax deductible, not just for corporations, but also for individuals, so that there is no penalty to individuals. Uh, <clears throat> uh, to provide a safety net, and the safety net can be in the form of providing a dollar amount. I always try to describe this as in terms of defined contribution as opposed to defined benefit plans, if history says, tells us anything, all the defined benefit plans have uh, made many corporations to go bankrupt. So that's the sense in which uh, if we provide a dollar amount that is tied to income level so that the poorest of the society receives the uh, full dollar amount and then that progressively that is reduced and as your income is higher, then eventually at certain level there is no subsidy or that dollar amount. But that dollar amount then you can use to buy insurance so that even the uh, poorest of the population would have a basic uh, level of 
uh, health insurance that would be uh, available without uh, any cost out of their own pocket. Uh, <clears throat> and finally, uh, providing some incentive for responsible uh, behavior, responsible consumer, I think is important. One of the reasons why costs seem to have skyrocketed is because the payer doesn't care about someone else is paying for it. The insurance is paying for it. So, so the individuals don't care nearly as much. And I think uh, a healthcare system should be devised so that there is some incentive for an individual to be somewhat responsible. Final slide, you know, Trump in the globe. Um, uh, first is uh, this whole concept of nation building. I think uh, many of the developed countries, leaders of those developed countries, were infatuated with the idea that we could go into certain countries and build those nations anew, whether it may be in Iraq or in Afghanistan. But I think experience, it was well-intentioned. In my opinion, when Bush went into Iraq, and I don't want to get into whether WMD were there or not, or whether it was legal or illegal, but if you ask at the heart of it, it was well-intentioned in the sense that that regime was uh, led by uh, a rogue leader and it thought that, well, we will go in. It might have been sort of um, somewhat of, of we know better than you do type of uh, behavior, but it was well-intentioned, but reality is that it has been a miserable failure. We haven't been after spending trillions of dollars, that hasn't produced the desirable result. In some ways, nations are a reflection of the society that is there. So, uh, so the example I tend to give is that Japan and Germany, after World War II, were pretty much decimated in terms of, but they have been very developed nations in the last 50 years. And it would be foolish to think that the U.S. helped Japan and Germany or the rest of the Western countries helped them. Yes, it might be true that they helped them, but more as a little bit of helping hand, much of the heavy lifting was done by the people of those two countries themselves. And they are hardworking individuals. They are educated population. They are <clears throat> there is work ethic. There is civic sense of duty, especially in Japan, you hear that all the time, but also in Germany. So it was that society, that population, that really lifted themselves up and uh, from the uh, vanquished state of, of World War II, in spite of that, they have rebounded. Whereas we have spent trillions of dollars on much smaller population in some other parts of the world, and it hasn't, pro it hasn't produced the kind of results that were produced in places like Germany and Japan with a lot less resources. So I think we have to come to terms with that nation building is a utopian concept. And I think, I think we have to uh, recognize that it is futile. And perhaps uh, we have to have a different approach. And in that sense, to me, I think Trump is of that mindset. He doesn't want to go and try and do nation building. Uh, that doesn't mean that we won't offer some help. We won't serve as a catalyst, but there are limits to what we could do. Uh, in terms of security, it is that, that America first. And, and uh, 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 But that said, I don't think there would be uh, any intention to abandon allies. I think <clears throat> that recognition is there. Uh, the way he has tried to uh, couch it is that uh, developed nations should chip in for the security so that the burden falls more proportionately rather than disproportionately on the U.S. And to me, uh, you know, when I think about it, that doesn't sound like an unreasonable uh, concept. Uh, the biggest challenge, I think, is uh, going to be, and this is related to the Trumponomics, that uh, would there be a false sense of new friends like Russia, or would there be a trade war uh, with Asia, especially uh, China in particular. So that, that is, in, in many ways, that is a genuine concern. Uh, so with that, let me, let me stop here and say that thank you for giving me an opportunity to share some of my thoughts this uninterrupted time. I really appreciate that. But equally, I know you are uh, rearing to go in terms of asking some questions, and, and I will do my best job to try and respond to your questions. Thank you again. Okay.
great evening, and thanks for coming out. I wanted to give a thanks to Karthik again for helping organize this, and thank you all for coming out to the block next school. Uh, I'm going to ask the first question, and then we will go to questions from the audience. Can folks hear now? Is that better? We good? Technical difficulties. Yeah, should be on now. Okay, are we good? Very good. So, uh, SP, thank you again for coming out uh, this evening. I know it's a long trip from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I know it's a bit colder there in Cambridge, having spent a couple years there myself. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about President-elect Trump and the folks he surrounded himself by. I used to work in the White House, and there's this large picture of President Johnson. And I think of President Johnson, and there's this quotation that I just can't <clears throat> seem to shake. And he said, the presidency has made every man who's occupied it, no matter how small, bigger, and no matter how big, not big enough for the demands of the job. Now, the remarkable thing and the good thing is the presidency is really a team. It's a, it's a team of folks uh, who come together for the goodwill and the running of a nation. And looking at who President-elect Trump has named to his cabinet, it, there's a fair number of business folks, Steve Munchen to Treasury, Wilbur Ross to Commerce, Andrew Podsner to Labor, Rex Tillerson to State. What does the president-elect's cabinet fix? What do those point to in the direction that his administration is likely to go towards? Right. <clears throat> Great question. Uh, in terms of the cabinet picks, okay, first is the president always has the executive privilege of picking a team. The buck stops with the president in terms of the performance. So in that sense, I, I like to give any president a latitude in terms of who that team that he or she would like to pick. Okay, that's first. Second, if you look at the set of individuals, without a doubt, it is skewed toward business people. Okay? Uh, that said, these are extraordinarily accomplished individuals. Tillerson, as you said, to become CEO of ExxonMobil is not easy. You have to be smart. You have to be able to provide leadership. You have to be able to manage a large organization, an international organization. So in that sense, there is a skill set there that is quite extraordinary. Whether that one-to-one -one trans transfers to a political position, a government position, remains to be seen. But in terms of their intellect, their ability to manage group of individuals, individuals like him and others, they are extraordinarily accomplished individuals. So, so I think there's a degree of uncertainty about it, but I'm not worried about these individuals as not capable. They, they are extraordinarily capable. Okay? And this is, it's a good time to draw that comparison, the point that I made. Okay? And if you think about it, Obama had no experience. Obama had hardly any experience. He was only a few years as a senator, and before that, he was a professor and community organizer. So in that sense, I don't think he had ever managed more than a few people at a time. So that's the sense in which, but then we felt comfortable. We thought that we would take a chance with him becoming a president. So that's the sense in which I, I think that if you do a one-to-one -one comparison, this team comes out looking terrific. So. Great. Let's go to the audience. What we'll do is if you could just say, stand up when you get a microphone, say your name. We'll take about four questions per round, and then we can maximize questions that way to SP. Let's start over here, one in the back. Uh, I'm Rob Walters. Um, it's a uh, question related to the nation building area that you talked about, and that sounded very encouraging. But uh, there is something that's worrying there. This, this conversation with Taiwan seems yeah. to indicate a bit of nation building on the side, doesn't it? Don't you think that's a bit worrying? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> We have one in nation building. Uh, next question uh, there in the back. Oh, I will have to remember that. You know, it's right not easy. Down. You know, so I, you might be ascribing too much intelligence to me. You know. 
<laughs> we can go one by one if that's easier. How about we, would you like uh, to do that? It might be. I think that, okay, that might be. We'll so, so with Taiwan, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, I, I think, <clears throat> so let's look at the history here, okay? I mean, Taiwan, whatever, 70 years ago, uh, separated itself from mainland China. And the U.S., uh, while the presidents haven't gone there, but they have, we have been selling arms to Taiwan and doing so many things with Taiwan. We import their goods. We make investment there. All activity takes place just short of the political recognition in the fullest sense. And I think Trump said, well, I'm going to stand up for that. I mean, would we, if mainland China tries to annex Taiwan, would we just sit on the sidelines and not do anything? I would not feel good about that if we allow that to happen. And that's the sense in which <clears throat> Trump said, hey, look, they call, we sell arms to them, we recognize them in substance in so many ways, I'm going to take that phone call as well. So to me, that was refreshing, actually. Here. Um, that is not my question, but I want to say that you make it sound very simple, but that could be a third world war mm -hmm. with China. And Obama has handled that with kids' gloves precisely for that reason. But that is not what I wanted. What I want to say is I understand your point about trade. In fact, that was brilliant in how he tapped in every talk he gave. Trump, that is, about the need for trade and the people who are dissatisfied. But Tillerson, Pruitt, um, Perry, these are all climate change deniers. What good is it for us to have domestic, even global, uh, possibilities if we lose the planet we live in? Great point. Okay. <clears throat> so this is where Passion versus pragmatism, at least, you know, I, I see it. Okay, so. <clears throat> I was born in India, and I still have close connections with India. Okay. You try to tell anyone over there, because of the climate, please don't engage in economic growth, and they laugh at you. Anyone. They might say whatever, you know, but reality is what they want is a standard of living. Right now, India is $1,500 per capita. U.S. is $58,000. Okay. What they want is to move in the direction of U.S. In between, there are many other countries and that are doing well. So they want to, they have an enormous appetite for energy consumption. China, same thing. Look at the number of coal-fired plants that are coming up. So to me, it seems I think the right thing to do is that we make some investments in clean energy, whether the private sector does that because they see it as opportunities, or the government also chips in, and that will help make the clean energy far cheaper than carbon-based energy, and in the process we address the climate change. But trying to hector and exhort people from different parts of the world and trying to get a coordination, collusion or coordination among hundreds of nations with very different interests, population with a, I think we are chasing a mirage. So whether they are right or wrong in terms of denying as a reality. We are facing a reality whereby the interests of billions of people are so diametrically opposite to the interests of what you have said just now or what I might say also. And if we don't acknowledge that as reality, I don't know we will get very far. So to me, the right thing is to try and go a little bit in the direction of making the cost of clean energy lower and lower. 
offering subsidies and all that is not going to work because there are billions of people who would be not benefiting from any of that subsidy. Only the behavior might change in 100, 200 million people in the West at an enormous cost. So that's, that's where I am. So we do yeah. nothing. We do nothing about everything that has been done by all the nations for climbing to be aware of what we've done no. for the climate. I think, I think what, what I'm saying is, and I don't mean to be, you know, it, it, I don't want to say that I don't, you know, I'm disagreeing with you on the climate change part. I'm saying that as a practical matter, all the countries, in reality, they haven't achieved anything. Of all these Kyoto or Paris and this and that, they are all on paper. But reality is, look at the number of coal power plants that have been set up in China. Look at the pollution situation in places like New Delhi and China and other places. That I think it is make-believe for us that this is this climate control pact is working. In reality, it has not. Okay? If there is some way in which it can work, more power to that. But given the incentives of people from different parts of the world, I don't see how it will work. It just, it's, it's, you, you talk to individuals who are poor and try and tell them that don't produce CO2, and you will get a visceral reaction from them. Great. Next question, woman there in the back. Um, hello, my name is Silvana Maja. I, you mentioned that we shouldn't be so worried about his tweets or the way he behaves in the media. <clears throat> but I'm really afraid of what I call the Trump effect. And it's like, what is provoking on people? How people are reacting and are feeling entitled or legitimized to act like that, to bully other people, to commit, to make some racist and xenophobic uh, comments to other people. What do you think about this Trump effect or like what can cause in society? That's a, uh, that's a great point. I mean, you know, look, first and foremost, I will say there's no place for any of that behavior. I mean, if, if it is, we should stamp it out immediately. You know, in terms of, <clears throat> and I don't think Trump or any administration would condone that behavior. If, it, if it, someone engages in that, that would be immediately, it, would, it should be prosecuted. And if it is not, that would be bad of Trump or his administration, so without a doubt. So that's number one. Number two, I, I think the, there's a few on the fringes, in my opinion, that have been emboldened or that have engaged in that behavior. But it certainly hasn't been, in my at least assessment, anywhere near pervasive or widespread. The reports that keep coming, they are in you know, a several hundred million population, very isolated. Not that that is good. It, even those should be should not be there. I, I I I would say that. But there hasn't been anything to indicate that that it has been widespread, okay? And there are some, call them idiots or call them whatever you want, who might be using Trump's name to engage in that behavior. It's reprehensible. It should be prosecuted wherever appropriate. And whether it can be socially, morally, we should censure that behavior. And it should not, there's no place for that behavior. Are there any questions on this side? I think there's a hand right there. Thank you. Uh, this is a factual question. You mentioned this 35% uh, tax rate. Uh, and my understanding has been that that's a nominal rate, that the actual rate that uh, U.S. corporations pay, I mean, I'm not talking about shenanigans, you know, right. any of this cheating stuff, but that the actual rate that American companies pay is actually very close to the average once you take into account the rebates, the incentives, the, the you know, the, the various ways in which uh, parts of America try to make it more attractive for corporations. And, you know, that might lead companies to 
be upset about that other companies are getting a better deal and so on. That's a problem with the structure of the tax system. Yeah. But, you know, it has implications for lowering taxes on a kind of general level. Yeah. Is that yeah. not correct? Or have I been reading The Economist wrong? Or <laughs> Sometimes I have doubts about economists, but that said, you know, uh, no, you, you, you're, you're right. So, so there are a couple points in this, okay? Uh, <clears throat> the, when there is nominal rate of 35 and actual, they pay somewhat less, even if it is legal, but somewhat less. But that is true elsewhere also. So elsewhere where there is 25%, they don't actually pay 25 either, somewhat lower. So, so that bringing it lower would make the playing field more level. That's number one. Number two, some of the deductions might be taken away so that there would be a closer correspondence between the nominal rate and what is called the effective rate. So that, and I think it would be sensible to do that, especially in the, on the personal taxes side, that's what has been discussed. And that, that you know. Uh, third, I think when the Treasury Secretary and OMB, uh, head of OMB, you know, they sit down and with the president and work out numbers, what they will realize is that you cannot just unilaterally lower the revenue source and still hope to make good on the promises that you have made on so many other dimensions. So the actual changes that we will observe are going to be far less than what we have heard Trump talk about during elections. In that sense, he's not unique. I think most people do that. Is that good or bad? I leave it for others to judge that. But that tends to be uh, how elections get fought. And, uh, and that's what we will observe here in this case as well. Okay. That's my expectation, at least. As a quick follow-up to that, 1986 was the last major tax reform. Ronald Reagan, Tip O'Neill, basically the Treasury too. It was a revenue-neutral bill, but you saw tax rates dramatically decrease. Right. In some of the <clears throat> efforts to accelerate economic growth, do you see tax overhauls the potential to perhaps institute that? Taxes will do only so much. I mean, you know, a, the reality is that we are already in a lot of deficit. So some amount of rationalization of taxes and some tax reform, I think, would be good. But ultimately, the Treasury has to collect revenues which are about you know, 20, 22 percent of the GDP. Otherwise, it would be difficult to pay all the bills. Uh, so you, you, you're right that Reagan instituted the tax reform, and it had wonderful effect. The idea is that somewhat lowering or rationalization of these taxes would accelerate growth, and as a result, there would be more income, and therefore, even at the lower tax rate, there would be more revenue that is collected. So, mm -hmm. Up here? Yeah, I was wondering, how do you explain, uh, yeah, uh, how do you explain uh, Trump's love affair with Russia, and Putin in particular? Uh, <laughs> I, I, <clears throat> there are some mysteries in the world, and that, that might be one of them. But it's, I, I, think, I think it is, it, I think his view of Russia as not as threatening, that's a worldview, and many people may not agree. For example, you know, something that uh, you know, the bigger concern is China. I mean, I had to make these statements about different countries, but but that, that's how in global, in geopolitics, that's what it gets talked about. Whereas there are others who say that uh, Russia might be uh, somewhat belligerent and do certain things, but in terms of for the West, it's not a threat. And I don't think Trump really knows any of these, the, the, personally knows any of these things. So he is just going by having some relations with Russia may not be a bad idea. If having those relations proves difficult, he will kind of change his view on that. So, so one of the things that is good and bad about Trump is that 
there's not a very well-defined or deep ideology there. It's more along the lines of, and in, in some ways, you know, in, in some ways, Bill Clinton was like that. See, if you think about what Bill Clinton did, that he came with some healthcare ideas or some of those with Hillary Clinton, but in two years, when he found that he got defeated in the elections, and he saw that that is not working, he changed, and then he embraced ideas that were quite different. I like that. I like Bill Clinton because he was willing to embrace ideas that work. And that's the sense in which having a person who is not overly ideological as a CEO, as a president, I think can be helpful. So that's, that's where I am. You know. But of course, time will tell. So. I had a question there in the back. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Marcus Freitas. I'm from Brazil. Two quick questions. One, Trump apparently has three major challenges always. His tax returns, his relationship with the media, and also how he's going to handle his companies. Where do you think the media and everyone will be beating him as soon as he takes over on January 20th? And what will happen? Because that could be something that will be a problem for him. And the second question is, for emerging countries, the improvements in the United States situation somehow will generate a move of investments back to the U.S. How should emerging countries relate to the U.S. in the future? Thank you. So, great, great points. In terms of the media, you know, whether it is tax returns, in terms of the other point that you made, uh, this is not going to be a very smooth relationship. I don't expect that. And, and some of it is legitimate, some of it is not. But in the net result is that it's not going to be a smooth. The question is how much he gets distracted. It, it, I, think, I think in some ways we would be, uh, the expression that comes to mind is cutting your nose to spite your face. On the part of if, if the idea of the media or the those who are attacking is well-intentioned, then distracting someone overly so uh, is not really good. But that's not my place or anybody's to say how they should engage. But, but that's the thought that comes to my mind. Uh, whether it is you know, uh, tax returns and some of those other things, uh, they, they will ask. He has, uh, I'm not a big fan of not disclosing those, but that said, uh, to me, in terms of his economic policies or his business interests, those in the overall scheme of things, that's not going to affect whether his economic policies succeed or not. So in that sense, you know, as I said, at a personal level, I'm not a fan of avoiding or hiding those, that information. But that said, I'm uh, of the mind that the economic policies and the economic growth that we will experience is not going to be overly shaded by those failure, failures to disclose. So that's the point about, I think the more substantive point is about uh, the uh, emerging markets and whether some of the investment will, there would be a flight of investment from emerging markets into the US. Uh, my own thinking on that is that, uh, no, I, I, think, I think the world is interconnected in a fashion that there is a lot of positive, what we call in finance, positive covariance. That swamps any negative zero-sum type of phenomenon. So what's good for China, what's good for India, what's good for the US, they are all the same things. So I think that having more equitable tax rates or fair trade, more business-friendly regulation, if other countries also embrace the same set of policies, then this is the case where rising tide lifts all boats would actually be true. That's the viewpoint. That's what history suggests repeatedly, that 
that the countries move together rather than something being good at the expense of another country. That latter phenomenon is far less. Okay. Uh, let's go here on this side. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Hijo Kang. Uh, first, I'd like to really thank you for your candid views and your courage to, you know, in an effort to shed any silver li light on silver linings to this um, situation that's shocked and stunned so many of us. Um, uh, you know, in order to move forward, I do think that we need more views like this. However, in you know, talk speaking of moving forward, um, for example. I want to refer to the Trump effect. Um, for example, at the Golden Globe speech, uh, when Meryl Streep uh, criticized the Trump effect and expressed concern about his temperament, um, Trump tweeted back. He was like, "Ignore her. You know, she's uh, overrated." Um, and I know that there are more qualities to a leader than temperament. However, what can Trump do in order to uh, to unite the two polarized camps that are, you know, biased to their own narratives and, you know, it, it's very disunited right now. So how can Trump as a leader uh, move the country forward? Thank yeah. you. That's a, that's a great point. I mean, you know, look, you know, <clears throat> what the irony of Meryl Streep's comment, however, it was about humiliation. Now, you ask yourself, what did she do? She wanted to humiliate Trump. I mean, you know, she was criticizing the fact that Trump humiliates others, but then she chose to humiliate Trump. So I don't know how to react. You see what I'm saying? I mean, he, here he is. He fought the election. He won. He's, his views are different. He was not hiding those views in terms of his policies or some of those things. So in some ways, I would have said that, uh, well, if Meryl Streep would have said something nicer than how she characterized it, in spite of the fact that she was deferring, uh, that might have been better rather than trying to humiliate Trump. And he hit back. Now, that said, I would have done somewhat differently in the sense that I might not have. I might have ignored some of those comments as opposed to trying to uh, hit back. But there are different individuals. But I think both sides, I think all of us have to exercise more restraint. We have to, the person won the election, so we have to accept that rather than, that doesn't mean that you roll over and say that we embrace the policies, but to question the legitimacy of that or to keep, you know, that I don't think is going to be productive. I don't think that is going to heal the, the division, that is. And I think it is equally, I think it is incumbent on him, I thought his comments about Hillary Clinton or the Clintons after the elections were gracious comments. That okay, and I think it, we could have continued with that. Uh, but but unfortunately, uh, we are living in a polarized world, and I, th I think both sides are in that respect uh, uh, doing. I mean, I, I tend to read New York Times as well as some of the right wing kind of thing, and I say that. Uh, forget New York Times, uh, but some of the more uh, extreme liberal, some of that. And I shake my head on both, both of those, the extremes. I think they are the ones who are getting a lot of the play, and I think we, we need to resist from both of those extremes. You know, that's at least my uh, view here. <clears throat> Lucas, fellow MPP classmate, you give a question? Hello, uh, thank you so much for joining us um, and for your courage to, for these very candid views, as mentioned before. Now, we are in Europe, and uh, I'd like to touch on your points regarding Trump and the world, uh, yes. especially regarding its allies, because Trump, during the campaign, so a lot of doubt about his future commitment to NATO, for example. Um, he was, he, he's, all, all the very few things that he has said on his foreign policy was very business-like as well. It was, if you pay us, we, we give you some security. 
Um, Europe has always depended immensely since World War II on on the United States as kind of a big brother to to keep the Russians away. Um, they that's kind of why they why they joined in NATO in the beginning as well. And uh, now some of his appointees have sought a lot of doubt on his future commitment to 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 his allies. I think it was Tillerson that, for example, said that the Baltics are just a suburb to Russia. He didn't say that uh, like a few days ago, but he s said that a couple of years back. And that, of course, generates a lot of, uh, of, of friction and a lot of uh, angst, in a way, uh, especially in Eastern Europe. And my question to you would be whether, from your perspective, um, a lot of this is just talk, or if there's actually a case for, for especially Eastern Europe, uh, to, be, to be afraid of, of, of the US pulling out and, and filling that vacuum, maybe um, somebody else filling in. Culturally, economically, and on so many dimensions, we are so intertwined with the West, including the Eastern Europe, that it's simply not going to be possible, no matter what Trump says, it's more bark than bite, that it's not going to be. Our, our bond is extraordinarily strong, and it will remain that way. It, it, it's not going to be the case that the allies would be abandoned. And you saw that, his position on Israel. I mean, you know, that would be the first ally to abandon, if, 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 if anything. And many people, even in, the, in Europe, would like to. But that's not what he would do. I think, ideologically, that the connection between Europe and the US is so strong. Also, Australia and New Zealand, some of the uh, Western democracies around the world, so I don't think that would be abandoned. Now, that said, as I have said, I think getting people to be somewhat responsible for the security cause, I think that's the point that he is trying to make. And that part, I think at least as an initial statement, uh, to me at least it makes sense because conditions have changed dramatically since World War II and so many of the countries are very well developed and they have resources, Japan certainly has resources, and that they should contribute to some extent to the security, to me doesn't strike as unreasonable, but maybe I'm missing something. So, so that's, that's the sense in which uh, I think it is more bark than, than bite, in my opinion. We have time for about two more questions, so um, anybody else would like to ask? Uh, we'll go one here, and we'll start here. My name is David Gosling. My, sorry, thanks. My name is David Gosling. My question is about his judgment and indeed his integrity when it comes to his business affairs. His refusal to put his companies into a blind trust, instead leaving him, them to his sons to manage. His sons, who are his personal advisors, yeah. seems to me to be potentially extraordinarily dangerous. That's a great point. I mean, you know, look, you know, the reality is that no matter what he does, you know, the fact is that he has billions of dollars worth of businesses, right? And if you go down, and I, 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 <clears throat> I'm not trying to be defending, there, there is going to be conflict of interest and in how he manages it. If he sells it, the price, sale price becomes an issue. Right? I mean, that would be one is to say that, well, I'm going to divest from all of these things, and someone will divest it, and that, whatever the dollar amount, that would be invested in, say, the broad-based stock market. Just let us suppose that. But at what price do you sell it? Does that price the buyer is giving an inflated price? Some of us will immediately say that, well, you know, it was Trump's. They wanted to favor Trump. So they paid an inflated price. That kind of criticism will come. So the point I'm trying to make is, no matter what it is, it's a bad situation. The conflict is not going to go away. And he will have to continuously work hard. And that is earlier point that was being made. It will get asked repeatedly. And if he does show some favoritism through his sons or whatever it is, well, he should be nailed for that. 
So that's the sense in which he will have to walk that tightrope. But there isn't a silver bullet. There isn't a simple solution. That's, that's the concern that I have. I mean, you know. But there is a blind trust as a simple solution. No, I, I'm saying the blind trust is also because that business, someone has to run it. And then what are the terms of that business being run? So that becomes, it, we, we just move the question to a, maybe you have a solution that it has eluded me. I'm not trying to, as I said. But I don't think there is an easy solution. Once you have billions of dollars, whichever way you do it, it comes back to bite you in, in one way or other, it seems to me. Uh, whether the approach that he has taken, including that you know, accepting no salary and some of the profit will go to the treasury and those things, are they adequate? I don't know. They, there would still be some questions. That's Last a question. Point. Uh, young gentleman in the hoodie. <laughs> Hello, I'm Diego Aveleira, and the question I wanted to ask you is, uh, you mentioned uh, Trump's attitude towards healthcare, international trade and relations, infrastructure, economy, uh, but I would like to uh, ask you about uh, your prediction on what he will do about the armed forces, uh, if he will uh, allocate more of the government expenditure, spending on the armed forces or if he will have other major topics to worry about during his presidency? That's a good point and I, I must, you know, just, in all the discussion, other than treating veterans better, I haven't heard anything to suggest that there would be a huge increase or decrease in uh, expenditures on on armed forces or on, on defense. Uh, at least that's my uh, understanding, but that is more as a result of uh, he not having said much about it. So that, that's what I'm parroting that. Uh, and in terms of, he does talk about security of the U.S. is vital, and that would imply that there might be some increase in defense spending but still, if, if it was something substantial spending increase that he, he was contemplating, uh, I would have thought that we would have heard about it, but, but he has been rather silent about it. So I think it's more the status quo. Reality is an enormous dollar amount gets spent on defense, and given the demands that are on other demands that are there, it is hard for me to imagine that there would be a significant escalation in defense spending. Uh, and there isn't a geopolitical reasoning, there isn't a big war that is taking place that calls for extra defense spending. So that's the sense in which I expect more the status quo rather than a big change. Yeah. I will ask one final closing thought for you. and. Uh, Lynn, Mo Lynn Miranda, Mo Miranda, who wrote Hamilton, described a legacy as something you plant in a garden that you never get to see. Yes. In, in a sentence, perhaps, could you please describe what your hope is for Trump's legacy as President of the United States? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when the choice was between Hillary Clinton and Trump, my thought was that no matter what each candidate has said, that Hillary Clinton will take the U.S. economy a little bit to the left, and Trump will take the economy a little bit to the right. Whether that little bit of movement to the right, whether that he's able to realize or not, you know, if he is able to swing that a little bit to the right, I think that would be his legacy. Whether that takes place or not, time will tell. Okay. On behalf thank of the Botnik School, please uh, thank our guest, Professor S.P. Kutari. Thank you. 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 Thank you all for coming. <clears throat>